Shabbat Shalom. It's great to be back after Sukkot and for us to start this new cycle together. And I'm so blessed and excited as we can delve in this week. We're going to delve into the beginning of what I hope is going to be an amazing, amazing adventure in the Scriptures to really reveal the mystery, the mystery of the Malkit Zedek, the Malkit Zedek. And like I said yesterday, this is, this is coming to be a, a, a favorite phrase of mine right about now. I didn't say it in, in the full Italian, so I'm going to practice my Italian right now. Si vi passem, parabellum. Sounds good, doesn't it? Si vi passem, parabellum. If you want peace, prepare for war. But our war is not against flesh and blood. You see, our war is against principalities. Our war is against the vain traditions of men that bind us. Those vain traditions that keep us shackled, the myths, the cultural myths of society, the religious myths, all of those traditions that would try and enslave the Zadiks in each and every generation. Because I believe there are the Zadiks, the righteous ones that Yahweh calls out in each and every successive generation. And each generation is accountable to the truth that the Ruach HaKodesh reveals to that generation. So we can't have the excuse of, oh, well, my great-grandmother, she didn't know about the Torah. Was she faithful to the revelation of that generation? If she was faithful to the revelation of that generation that was being poured out and she walked with Yeshua, then she was a Zadik. But you and I cannot walk on the backs of the previous generations. We have to be held accountable to what is being revealed in this generation. And that will determine whether we are part of the Zadokun, the faithful, righteous remnant. So as I believe we go through this study of the Malkit Zedek, our king, our king is righteous. And that's what Malkit Zedek means. Our king is righteous. But what do we do? What do we do when we find the Savior? I found the Savior when I was 24 years old. But what do we do when we find the Savior? I ended up in church like many of you did. I found a denomination that I fit into. Ultimately, I ended up learning that denomination's doctrines, what was acceptable to believe, and what behavior was acceptable to display. And then they taught me by default not to mix in anything in the Old Testament, to, but to mix in the cultural holidays and the cultural traditions and then sing songs to Jesus on Sunday. And when I started to question that narrative, things started to squeeze upon me and eventually I was shown the door. Because to the devout... To the Zadiks in each and every generation. To those that are committed to the study of the word of Yahweh. To those that are truly transformed. We can see that the veneer is cracking. We can see that the veneer of our culture is becoming worse. Every Halloween, every Christmas, every Easter, we can see the veneer of the religious institutions, that it is cracking. We can see the veneer of the Jesus that they're presenting to us, that it's cracking. Because it's built upon the traditions of men. But to the devout, to the Zadiks, we say, no. We know the Savior because He's in us, and He calls us to walk in holiness and righteousness, and it shouldn't look like the culture. So He draws His people unto Himself. There has got to be more, is the cry of the saints, because the Scripture says that it's to the faith that was once delivered to the saints it's the saints who sit in the pews and hearts cry out, there's got to be more. There's got to be more. It's to the saints, the righteous, the Zadokim, whose heart says, 
I'm hungry and I'm thirsty. Yet Moshiach, the Savior, said that you would never hunger and that you would never hurt thirst. So therefore, we open up this word and we start to read the next verse and the next verse and the next verse. And we start to think about context and we start to question the culture that is starting to seep through the halls and the doorways of the congregations. And we say, get it out of here. We want the culture of Yahweh. We want his Sabbaths. We want the Feast of Tabernacles. If it's in the Bible, we will we will follow it. If it's not, we're going to chuck it to the curb. And that begins this great faith walk that we have. But we do have to rightly divide the word of truth. Second Timothy tells us, rightly divide the word of truth. So what's all of this about? What is all of this about? We follow Christ. We're all familiar with the term Christ. Very familiar with the term Christ. Many think it's Jesus' last name. They do. Many think it's Jesus' last name. Most don't realize even that the letter J itself is a relatively, relatively recent invention from about 1530. So now we're left with the, the fact that Christ's Christian name didn't even begin with a J. And that it wasn't even a Christian name because Christ wasn't a Christian. And, and you begin to go, well, hang on a minute. I'm starting to question the narrative. The letter J was invented in 1530. Christ isn't his last name. So Jesus can't be his first name. And then things start to get very uncomfortable for you because you're starting to question the traditions and vanity of man through facts, through history, and we can continue to go down this route, and the road gets narrower and narrower and narrower. In fact, Christ just means any anointed one from the Greek pantheon of gods. They had many anointed ones, and a Christ was just one of their daily deities. But the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us the title of our Savior. He is the righteous king, the Malki Zedek. Now, are we trying to emulate a shadow of the biblical reality? Is that why so many people are looking to go deeper? I mean, have we been presented with a veneer by our religious culture instead of the very substance? And that's what I believe. I believe that we have been presented a veneer, and we can see the devout, the righteous saints, we can see that the veneer is cracking. We can see that the culture seeped into the church. We can see that the culture is now directing the dialogue instead of the word of Yahweh. And the veneer cracks and we say, we're out of here. We're going to follow Yahweh. We're not following the culture. And we're not going to follow the religious dogma of men. It's time. And Yahweh's people are waking up all over the world to the righteous king, Yeshua, the Messiah, who saved his people to walk in covenant relationship with him. That's the call of the Zadik in this generation. Will we be true to that call? Deuteronomy 29, verse 29. The secret things, they belong to Yahweh. But those things which are revealed belong to us and our children forever if we will seek them out. Mishle, Proverbs chapter 25, verse 2. It is the glory of Yahweh to conceal a thing, but it's the honor of Melachim, of kings, is to search out a matter. And you and I are supposed to be a kingdom of priests, and we're supposed to search out these matters that Yahweh has hidden from the heathen. He's hit because they would trample it underfoot and desecrate it. It's like throwing your pearl before swine. Yahweh hides his mysteries because the people don't deserve it. It's only the Zadakim, the righteous, that have the heart to search it out. The masses, you look out there, they're not sheep. They're nice and white and fluffy, but they're goats. 
masquerading as sheep. They're not serious about the faith. Those that are serious about the faith in Yeshua will always be hated. They will always be marginalized and they will always be kicked to the curb. That is the test to see if you're on the narrow road. If you're comfortable, if you're embraced, and if you're sitting amongst thousands, you're most probably deceived. Because that's a broad road that leads to destruction. It's the narrow road that leads to life. And there is a rabbinic ditch on one side and there's a lawless ditch on the other side. But the narrow road to life is covenant, royal Torah following the Malkit Zedek Yeshua himself. And I want to speak more about that because I believe instead of looking to the pantheon of the Greeks and the Christos, Instead of looking to the culture where the veneer is cracking, let's look to the Word and let's find out what this mystery, this mystery of the Malkit Zedek is. So I want to introduce you to Yeshua. Yeshua, our King, is righteous. Yeshua, salvation. Now the author of the book of Hebrews identifies him as the Malkit Zedek. And I'm going to jump right in, right in, and use biblical names and biblical titles for our studies. Not these made-up English and Greek substitutes as we delve into the Word together, because that is all part of peeling away the veneer. Why use something that's not true just because it's a tradition from 1530? Why pick a title out of the Greek pantheon when our Savior was a Hebrew? Why use a nondescript, non-relevant name that is veneer, that is cracked, when you can delve and grab the very substance, which is the word of Yahweh? When you look in the New Testament, you see these terms, James the just, the half-brother of Yeshua. Yeshua is often referred to as the just one, the just one. The Hebrew word there is Zadik. He was the Zadik. And many of the followers were referred to as the Zadikim. Yaakov the Zadik, Yeshua the Zadik, because they were walking in the way of the Malkit Zadik. In the ways of righteousness. Yochanan Hamatbil, John the Immerser, his name in the Hebrew, Yochanan Hamatbil, his parents, they were the righteous, they were Zadakim. Rav Shaliak Shaul, Rabbi Apostle Paul, he was a Zadik, a righteous one. A just one. But we forget that these English names, once they're translated, they're supposed to be connecting you to our King who is righteous. Instead, we've all followed this veneer that leads us back to the Greek pantheon of gods, and we end up with this Greco-Roman veneer, and it isn't cutting it for me, and it's not cutting it for you. Truly. So if you're disheartened in the faith, if you're disheartened in the faith, you're amongst good company. You are amongst good company. Turn with me to Luke 24, verse 13. It's the Passover. It's Pesach, the Passover in Jerusalem. This is one of the feasts that Yahweh commands His people, His men, to come up and celebrate. People would save up all year to go up, to ascend to Jerusalem, to keep Pesach, Passover, Yet we find here in our text in Luke that these Talmudim, these disciples, they've walked out of the Feast of Yahweh. They've abandoned the Feast of Yahweh. They are having a crisis of faith. They are disheartened. They are demoralized. Everything that they hung their hopes on, they hung their hopes that Yeshua would be the deliverer of Israel and he failed them. They're totally dead. He's dead. He's in the grave, and they, they are abandoning everything that the faith caused them to do to come to Passover. And all of a sudden, this mysterious man appears by their side. 
What are you talking about? Why are you so sad? Are you the only one who doesn't know what just happened in Jerusalem? Where have you been? Have you been out in some far country? Because everybody knows what's been going on. You haven't heard? The one that we were hoping for to redeem Israel, he's dead. And he goes on to say, let me expound from Moses and the prophets and show you all things. Because if you want to open up your eyes, there is a principle that you need to follow. And it doesn't begin in the book of John. It begins by looking at the writings of Moses, taking that thread and weaving it through to the writings of the prophets, and then taking that thread in the tapestry and coming into covenant. Because then you'll begin to unravel the mysteries of the Malkit Zedek. Yahweh doesn't want us to be foolish in our faith concerning our Savior. We must believe all that the prophets have spoken, and we must begin understanding the teachings of Moses, then the prophets, to truly embrace Yeshua. Those are not my words. They are Yeshua's words. You can believe that, or you can believe somebody who says, hey, come to Bible study, and we'll begin with the book of John. It's like me getting a book off the shelf and saying, why don't you start reading it two-thirds way through? Don't, don't worry about the first major portion. Just read, read the last, you know, bit of the book. No. Start at the beginning and follow and build. You see, we've got to believe what Moses and the prophets wrote to truly understand what Yeshua did. It's a God-given mandate for us, and the NIV, and the Sunday sermons are not going to lead us into the intimate relationship that our Savior demands. The NIV isn't going to cut it. That's why it's called the nearly inspired version. It, I, I thought it was. Then there's, the, there's, the, the, there's the, the BLT, the bacon, lettuce, and tomato version. What's that one called? That's the NLT. The NLT. We've got an NLT at home. It's very old. We call it the BLT. I mean, you read it, and there's, there's words in there, like idioa, Jew, that don't even exist in any Greek manuscript. They just decided to put them into the text. I mean, literally, you go, but it's not in any Greek manuscript, so how did it end up in our Bible? It's insanity. So that one I do call the bacon, lettuce, and tomato because that one gets the sandwich. <laughs> Matthew chapter 6, verse 33 informs us this. What do we do, the question was asked, when we find the Savior? What do we do? Do we go to church and become a neophyte? No. We are to seek first the Malchut, the kingdom of Yahweh, and his righteousness. Two terms right there. Right there, what do you do when you find the Savior? Malchut Zadakah, Malkit Zadak. The kingdom of righteousness is the first thing that you're to seek. Once you do that, everything else is going to be added to it. If you fight that, you're going to find your life is never going to be fulfilled. You are never going to get the fulfillment of what it believes to be a scripture-believing person who's to follow Yeshua. You will always feel hungry. You will always be missing something because you didn't do first things first. Amen. It's like getting up first and watching Oprah instead of getting up first and praying and doing your Bible study. Your day is not going to go well. <laughs> It's not going to go well for you. You will never recover from that. <laughs> Romans chapter 10, verse 2. They have a zeal for Yahweh, 
but not according to knowledge. That was me. On fire, 24 years old, zealous for Yahweh, just making enemies everywhere I could go. And then when people ask me, well, where do you... F-? I don't know where it is in the Bible, but repent. <laughs> Shouldn't be doing that stuff anymore. Had a zeal for Yahweh, but not according to knowledge. For they are being ignorant of Yahweh's Zadakah, Zadik, righteousness. There's a theme here. They are zealous, but they're not aware of anything to do with righteousness, the Malkit Zadik calling of the priesthood. They go about to establish their own Zadikah righteousness. They have not submitted themselves. They haven't began to be humble, too prideful, too prideful because they're attached to the culture rather than to the word of Yahweh. You see, the culture breeds pride. The religious culture that's taught in the churches breeds pride too. Because what it tells you is that you can go out there and do what you want, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, as long as you come to Culture Club on Sunday, (laughs) where boy George is going to get up front and (laughs) preach the sermon. I'm being facetious, but it does... I mean, it, sometimes it, it did get like that. It did. It was almost like we had Culture Club up on the screens on Sunday service. And I'd, I'd be shuffling in my seat and I'd say to my wife, I can't do this anymore. I do not want to come to church and rock out. I really, I don't. I mean, I, I just can't do this anymore. I do not want to know about the beavers and the ducks in my sermon. I'm sorry. I'm trying to guard myself from this filthiness, and now I'm having a sermon and we're talking about Survivor. I haven't even watched TV since 1991. This has no business being in the assembly of the saints. No business whatsoever, and I'm offended, okay? Because I don't have time for this. This is my time to get fed in the word of Yahweh. So we can see then that first things first is to seek the Malkut, of Yahweh, the kingdom of Yahweh, and his zadokah, his righteousness, the problem arises, Romans 10 verse 2, they have a zeal for Yahweh, but not according to knowledge, they being ignorant of Yahweh's righteousness, zadik, go about to establish their own righteousness, zadikah, they have not submitted themselves to the zadikah, righteousness of Yahweh, for Messiah is the actual goal of the Torah. That's the purpose of Messiah. He's the goal of the Torah for an eternal Zadik, righteous standing to everyone that believes. Romans chapter 12. Zadik, 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 Zadik. Did you get it? It is about righteousness. It's about following the Malkit Zadik. But we don't understand these terms. We don't understand that Zadik is connected to a very important character in Scripture, Hebrews chapter 6 and 7, and introduced to us in Genesis, that we don't understand because we've so caught up in the veneer of Christos that we don't even understand what that is. But we accept it. We accept the veneer, but we don't accept righteous, Zadik, concrete Hebrew words that are attached to real people. Not mythical Greek and Roman words that are attached to pagan deities. How can we accept those, but we can't accept Malkut Zadika? That's concrete. That's not going anywhere. And if you track that back, that's going to lead you right to Yahweh. If you track Christ back, it's going to lead you to one of many of the Greek gods, And if you track J back, it's going to lead you to an invention of 1530. Because Yeshua is salvation. Yahweh is our salvation, his full name, Yahushua. The Aramaic short form, Yahshua or Yeshua, meaning salvation. It's amazing. But I like concrete in this mystical, spiritual world that we live in, that you can't reach out and touch it. I need to reach out and touch it. You see, our faith is supposed to be a deep work. 
It's supposed to enable us to bring inner healing. The alone time where Yahweh transforms us. Yahweh's word is to lead you into the Malkit Zadik, the king of righteousness, where the king of righteousness will do his work as the master physician of healing you, of cleansing you, and of healing all the brokenness in our families and in our lives. That's what he's called to do. He will take away your past sins if only you will walk in his righteousness. Revelation 2 tells us that you are, each and every one of you, if you follow the Malkit Zedek, you will be enabled to walk as a kingdom of priests. And there is neither male or female, slave or, fr or free, but you are all one in Messiah. I want to demonstrate to you through the word how Yeshua is the long-awaited Malkit Zedek. And his people today aren't supposed to join a denomination, but actually are to join a priesthood. How about that? Don't join a denomination, join a priesthood. That should be our banner out front. All right, can you work on that? Because we need to function on a higher plane, a higher plane than the religious denominations of men which leave you dry and hungry for his word. And when I start talking about this to believers, do you know what they do? This is what happens. Grace! What about grace? We're under grace. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Noah. That's right. Noah found grace in Yahweh's sight. And we'll come to understand Noah's relationship to the Malkit Zedek a little bit later in this teaching. But Noah did find grace. You're right. Grace is important. But do we understand what grace means? Let's peel away the veneer and let's really understand it concrete Bible terms. Not spiritualese, but let's connect it to the word of Yahweh where it's anchored and it has substance. Not my words, Yahweh's words. Not some priest, prophet, pastor, or politician. But let's find out what really happens when we experience grace. Because yes, we do need to have grace. And we need to walk in His grace. And I challenge each and every one of you that uses the word grace to really back it up with your walk. Because it's this Hebrew word, chen, chen, or chesed, chesed. And it appears three times more in the Old Testament than it actually does in the New Testament. Grace didn't start at Pentecost, at Shavuot. It didn't. Many people think that it did. Grace isn't a license to live in sin and not obey Yahweh's royal law. You see, grace is the empowerment to live a holy and righteous life in a sick and twisted world. That's what grace is. The Western Christian church isn't under Yahweh's grace. They're under His mercy. The withholding of righteous, just judgment. If they were under his grace, they wouldn't be violating the law. Because grace empowers you to keep the law and live a holy, just, righteous life. Grace is what empowers you to keep the commandments. It doesn't allow you to live a lawless life of church tradition. It doesn't allow you to. Grace is what convicts us to continue on to our higher calling, the Malkit Zedek calling. So the fact is, the clarion call of grace is by a people who don't understand Yahweh's grace. They're actually under His mercy, and they haven't even experienced His grace. Because if they had experienced His grace, they'd be keeping the law. Amen. Isn't that a paradigm shift? But the sad thing is, Yahweh is going to remove his mercy. And the moment he removes mercy in the tribulation, what is going to come? 
on those that sing the song of grace. Nothing more than deserved judgment for flaunting the word of Yahweh. It's very serious. It's a very serious calling that we have. But many people, Hebrews 10, 26, they trample the son's blood underfoot and they count the new covenant of grace a common thing. Beware. Handle the blood of the lamb very, very devoutly. In fact, be a Zadig. Seek first the kingdom of Yahweh and everything else will be added to it. Stop making mistakes. And stop mistaking Yahweh's mercy, the withholding of just judgment, whilst you're on the teat for grace. Because the empowerment to keep the commandments is the diet of meat. Get off the teat and get on the meat. Are you allowed to say that in congregation? <laughs> I made sure I capitalized the two E's. But that does come from the Bible. That's Hebrews 5.13, right, for you. So if Yeshua is the Malki Zedek, where did the Malki Zedek come from? You can cut out any of this, brother. So, you know, <laughs> don't you worry. That's why I made sure that this was all the preamble. Okay? Be like, edit, <laughs> cutting floor. No, seriously, though. If Yeshua is the Malkit Zedek, where did the Malkit Zedek come from? How was it established? And where do we, Yeshua, where do we see Yeshua even walking and using this authority? I mean, not much is actually mentioned of the Malkit Zedek in Scripture, to be honest. There's not that much. He's only mentioned in three places in the entire Bible. So we only have a limited amount to pull from. But once your eyes become wide open to Malkut Zadikah, the kingdom of righteousness, what will happen? Everything else will be added to it, you see. So you'll begin to see once those eyes open up. You see... Within the story of Abraham, we see the Malkit Zedek as he returned from recapturing his nephew Lot in Bereshit, Genesis 14, verse 18. Within one of King David's Psalms, Psalm 110, speaking of Mashiach, Messiah, and then we see the Malkit Zedek within the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, 6, and 7. So let's start at the beginning with our investigation into the Malkit Zedek to find out more about this mystery. So it is no longer a mystery to those of us that seek first the kingdom of Yahweh. Turn with me to Bereshit, Genesis chapter 14, verse 17. Genesis chapter 14, verse 17. Then, after his return from the defeat of Shedaloamah, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom, went out to meet him at the valley of Shavar, that is, the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was the priest of El Elyon. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of Elohim Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be Elohim Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to Yahweh, Elohim, Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours for fear that you would say, I have made Abram rich. I will not take anything except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Ener, Eshkol, and Mamri. Let them take their share. Malki Zedek received a tenth of the spoils of Abram's victory against Shedaloamah. Now turn with me to Tehillim, Psalm 110, verse 1. 
Most of you are going to be reading it from the Masoretic text, which is what the King Jimmy comes from, is the Masoretic text. Yahweh said to my Adon, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Yahweh shall send the rod, a scepter of your strength out of Zion, and rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be willing in the day of your power, in the splendors of set-apartness, from the womb of the morning, you have the dew of your youth. Yahweh has sworn and will not lie so as to repent. You are a Kohen, a priest, forever and ever, after and in the order of Malkit Zedek. Verse 5, Yahweh at your right hand shall shatter kings in the day of his anger. Now, you may have caught that, verse 5. I said, Yahweh is at your right hand. This is a trick. This is a Masoretic trick because the Masoretes hate Yeshua. In about 900 of the common era, they began to transcribe this text. But the fact is, the ancient Hebrew and the Septuagint, which predates the Masoretic by 1,200 years, has Yahweh at your right hand. So therefore, verse 5, if you're paying attention, qualifies verse 1. Yahweh sits at Yahweh's right hand. And who sits at the right hand of Yahweh? Yeshua. So is Yeshua Yahweh? The breast of Yahweh beats upon the right chest of Yahweh. Because Yahweh is El Shaddai, and he tore out his bosom, and his bosom became flesh and walked among men and did the work of redemption. And somehow that turned into a triunity. Go figure. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, Yahweh your Elohim, Yahweh is Echad, a plural one. You see, the false religions of the world will tell you that there is Singular monotheism or polytheism. Judaism teaches singular monotheism. And by default, that has become a very popular Judaic tradition. Many of the nations, with their various gods, fall into polytheism, many gods. But the Bible teaches plural monotheism. Echad is a plural term for one, the plural one. But the Greeks, they believed in a triunity, which is a really, really morphed Greco-pagan cultural term for how they would assimilate all of their deities into these majestic beings. But when we go back to the scriptures, we find that Yahweh declares that he is Echad, a plural one. So plural monotheism is the faith that was once delivered to the Kedoshim. You see, the train has gone off the tracks. So much so that people can't even see when the veneer is peeled right back. They'll fight you because they're so used to the vain traditions of men. But there's always going to be one from a town and two from a city that have the blood-tipped ear, and they're going to follow and walk with the righteous saints. It's always going to be that way. You can't expect the masses to accept revelation that is hidden, because it's hidden so that those that have the heart will dig it out, and they then will be so zealous that you will hear them shouting from the rooftops, and beating their chests, the breasts of righteousness. It's exciting, this faith of ours that is delivered to us. It truly is. Let me continue on. Verse 5 of Psalm 110, it says, Yahweh is at your right hand. And again, the Masoretic edit has the Lord or Adon. But we find now that verse 5 qualifies verse 1. So verse 5 instructs us that, in fact, 
Yahweh sits at Yahweh's right hand. And he shall now, this is going to connect us back to our text in Genesis 14, because in Genesis 14, the Malkitzadik showed up at a battle about the kings, right? And look what the text says now. He shall shatter kings in the day of his anger. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall wound the leaders over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in its derek way. Therefore shall he lift up the head. And now we're going to find Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 5. So also Moshiach, Messiah, did not glorify himself so as to become a high priest, but he who has said to him, you are my son, today, when? Today I have begotten you. Just as he says also in another passage, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. This is extremely important because when we look at this in the Greek, we're going to find it reads this way. Kata ton taxin. Taxin is the text that we really want to focus on. Kata ton taxin malkitzedek. And it means an order, as in a sequential order of things. He is in the order, the taxin or the proper sequence or array of this Malkitzedek. He's in the sequence of Malkitzedek. What does that mean? Now, we're going to find this Greek word, taxine, also appears, just to make sure we're on the right track, in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. And let's find this Greek word, taxine, which means a sequential order of things. Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elisheva. They both were Zadiks, they were righteous in the sight of Eloah, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of Yahweh. Zacharias was performing his priestly service before Eloah in the appointed taxine order, sequential order of his division. And we find from Chronicles that there were 24 orders or divisions of this priesthood. You see, when the writer of Hebrews quotes Psalm 110 verse 4, he does it because he wants us to peel back the veneer. Because order is the Hebrew word the Hebrew word dibra. The Greek word is taxine, but the Hebrew word for order is dibra. Dibra. The word is only used four times in the Tanakh, and it literally means to put in order through speaking, because the Hebrew word Devar means to speak. It comes from that same word, Debra. So Debra means to put in a sequential order of things by speaking it, by vocalizing it, by putting that order out. It's a sequence of ordering. So we should be able to find some reference to others of this priesthood in Scripture then. Because if this is a sequential order, this priesthood, and it's put into order by speaking, then it should appear more times and we should be able to track it. Correct? Because then there would be those that came before the order and after the order. There was a sequence of things. Where else in the Bible... Do we find a reference to a person whose king is righteous, Malkitzedek? Where else would we find reference to that? Kepha Bet, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. Now, we have to understand this. There is no grammar in Greek. And the monks, you know the funky monks, 
the funky monks love to monk with grammar because you can monk the text up something rotten by adding your King James grammar. You can make the text say absolutely anything you want by adding grammar to it. Case in point, there's this fabulous verse in Corinthians, and it says something like this in the King Jimmy. I forgot. <laughs> so I'm going to turn there. Because I don't want to misquote it. Because then you'd have me you'd, you'd hang, draw, and quarter me. It says this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 14. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify that is the King James adding a whole ton bunch of grammar to the text. And it's interpreted this way. I can do anything. I can do what I want. Everything's lawful for me today. I'm under grace. I'm in the New Testament. But it gets better. Because then we can go down a few verses. You can eat. Whatever you want, whatever's sold in the meat markets, anything, you can eat it. Whatever is sold in the meat markets, asking no conscience, asking no questions for conscience sake. Eat whatever is set before you. Asking no con questions for conscience sake. If somebody puts a chopped up barbecue snake before you, don't ask any questions about it. Just bloody well eat it. That's insanity. This is what grammar can do to you. I didn't go to grammar school. That's what we call high school in England. Well, I did, but I didn't last very long. <laughs> Now, let me now go back and read it to you without any grammar and see if it actually now would be backed up by the rest of the Bible. All things lawful are for me, but not everything is edifying. If it's in the Torah... It's for you. But that doesn't even mean that everything in the Torah is necessarily edifying for you. All things lawful are for you. No grammar. Literal Greek. Does that make a lot more sense? Now, if you go down a few verses later, it would continue to say this. Everything in a meat market being sold, eat nothing. Ask questions for conscience sake. Everything set before you, eat nothing. Examining because of conscience. Meaning, when you go to the meat markets, excuse me, what is that? How was that slaughtered? Has that been put in a pagan temple and offered to a god? What exactly? I'm not going to eat anything. Now you go round to some Corinthians house and they set back around all this food. Don't eat a thing until you ask questions about what you're about to eat. When your conscience is convicted that it's okay for you to proceed, then proceed. Does that make more sense? You've got to watch out for the funky monks. And you've got to be careful of grammar. Because grammar is an invention of King Jimmy. Now this should be taught to you on day one when you go to church. And people can sit in the pews for 25 years and they're not even given this simple instruction.
Because if I add a bunch of grammar, I can put a hook in your mouth and I can lead you down any doctrinal path I want and you'll be so stupid you'll follow. This is supposed to be an edifying teaching about Malkitzedek. But we don't necessarily have time to make everybody feel happy clappy all the time. Sometimes people need admonition to pull your trousers up and get busy in the word of Yahweh. We do not have time to mess around. Time is short, but be careful of the grammar. That was my point. Let's get back on track. Because when the writer of Hebrews quotes Psalm 110 verse 4, order is the Hebrew word dibra. The word is only used, like I said, four times in the Tanakh, and it literally means to put in order through speaking, a sequence, or an ordering of things. And we now are going to be able to find more references of this in the Scripture because there are going to be those that came before in the order of Malkitzedek and those that walked after in the order of Malkitzedek. Now we're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. But my point... This was my point. I knew I had a point. We're not going to read 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4 with a bunch of grammar in it. We're going to remove the grammar and we're going to have a literal translation and it is going to blow our minds because we're going to get rid of the mud and we're going to take the specks out of our eyes and the Bible will come alive. So this is a literal translation without the King Jimmy grammar. Four. If a lower's messengers who sinned did not spare, but with chains of thick gloom, having cast them down to Tartarus, did deliver them to judgment, having been reserved, and the old world did not spare. But the eighth person, Noah, of righteous, a preacher, did keep a flood on the world of the impious having brought, and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah having turned to ashes. Let me repeat that last verse. But the eighth person, Noah of Zadik, a Zadik, a preacher, did keep a flood on the world of the impious, having brought, and the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah having turned to ashes. Now, this passage, now, now that we've removed the grammar, this passage does not say that there were seven others that were saved with Noah. You bung in the grammar, and that is what you walk away with. You remove the grammar, and you begin to dig and find and peel back the veneer, and you end up with a mystery. You end up with the secret things of Yahweh, but he's going to bury it under King Jimmy's rose garden. Now, we have to understand that King Jimmy had a little thing going for his boy Gardner, okay? So he, he wasn't exactly the righteous person that we all hold up to. Oh, don't desecrate the King Jimmy. King Jimmy was a raving homosexual who liked to play around in the rose garden with his gardener, okay? Let's be real about it, please. Crying out loud. He was a fairy. He was a puffer. That's what we say back home. He was as bent as a dog's hind leg. What is in this? <laughs> but the passage doesn't say that there were seven others that were saved with Noah. It says that Noah was the eighth preacher of righteousness. It says that Noah was the eighth preacher of righteousness. Now, the King James, actually, if it's decent enough, it will actually italicize one of eight people. Whose is italicized? I think it's the King Jimmy that does the italicis. That means that's code. It's not in the text. We decided to add it because we think it would look good in the text. But we're going to be somewhat honest to those of you that are going to wonder what the italicis means. And it means that we just threw it in there. Now, the NIV, they couldn't care less. I mean, they really couldn't. 
they're just going to stick it right in there. They may even bolden it, you know. But the King Jimmy, you know, at least they had a little bit of conviction. It's not in there. Will italicize it? Those that are really devout, they'll figure it out. But, you know, no one's going to listen to them anyway. They'll throw them out of the church and it won't be a problem. So anyway, the King James, he does, does at least italicize one of eight people. It's not in the text. So the question then remains, who were the previous seven in the spoken order, right? If Noah was the eighth in a sequential order of what? Righteous ones. He was the eighth. Noah was the eighth Malchizedek. That means there were seven before him, which means that there were more that came after him. We're going to discover the mystery of the Malchizedek. Now, this can't be saying that Noah was the eighth generation of mankind. Some would like to say that. Well, he was the eighth generation from mankind. No. Adam was the first. Seth was the second. Enosh was the third. Canaan was the fourth, Mahalel was the fifth, Jared was the sixth, Enoch was the seventh from mankind, Methuselah was the eighth, Lamech was the ninth, Noah was the tenth from Adam. So he certainly wasn't the eighth. So what can it be speaking about? How could Noah be the eighth? Part of the Malkitzedic mystery is that while Noah isn't the eighth generation of mankind, Noah is the eighth in a line of succession, beginning with Adam, of preachers of righteousness, preachers of the Malkitzedic. Noah was the eighth Malkitzedic. That is what the text is teaching us, but we have to remove the grammar. If we don't remove the grammar, you'll be eating snakes down the meat market, and you'll end up very sick. Yochanan, John actually says this, death reigned from Adam till Moses. So after Moses, nobody died. No. What is he talking about? Death reigned from Adam to Moses. Adam was the first Malkitzadik. Moshe Rabbeinu was the last Malkitzadik that was up on the mountain and didn't get corrupted when they broke the covenant at the golden calf. Death reigned from Adam to Moses, the first Malkitzadik to the last Malkitzadik until the Reformation would come from the final Malkitzadik, Yeshua. This we will soon discover. You see, Adam lived for 930 years from creation until his death. Then we find when Adam died, Seth was next in the line of succession. So Seth was the second Malkitzedek. The third Malkitzedek was Enosh. Now when Enosh died, the fourth Malkitzedek was Canaan. And when Canaan died, Mahalel, he was the fifth Malkitzedek. And when Mahalel died, Jared became the sixth Malkitzedek. And when Jared died, Methuselah became the seventh Malkitzedek because Enoch had been taken, Genesis chapter 5, verse 24, and therefore skipped in the line of succession. So when Methuselah died, who was the eighth Malkitzedek? None other than Second Peter tells us Noah was the eighth Malkitzedek because Noah took the role because Lamech, he'd already died. Noah, a preacher of the Malkitzedek, a preacher of righteousness, was the eighth in the line of succession. Second Peter 2.5, the succession that came from Adam. It's amazing stuff. So if Noah, as the preacher of righteousness from his generation, then who was the sequence Malkitzedian priests who were serving in this priesthood when Avraham rescued Lot and then gave Malkitzedek a tenth? Who was that Malkitzedek? Noah was the eighth, and when he died, then his son Shem would have been next in line. So Shem would have been the Malkitzadik in the days of Abraham. And this is actually mentioned and attested to in the book of Jasher. Now, the book of Jasher is mentioned three times in Scripture, and Shem 
is attested to as the Malkit Zedek in many historical so sources. But now I've mentioned that, there's going to be pushback because people are going to go to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3 and say, you can't say that, but let me explain because now I'm going to have to go on a little rabbi trail because I made that statement, okay? Because now, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 7, verse 3. Because now, like I say, that I mentioned Shem was the ninth Malkizedek, people are going to want to have some clarity brought forth on the text of Hebrews chapter 7, which says that Malkizedek was without genealogy. But I just said, I just gave you a genealogy, didn't I? So am I lying? Remember this. A text out of context creates a pretext and error begets error and we all go down into the lawless boat that sinks to the bottom of the ocean. So we have to remember the context of what the book of Hebrews is about. It's about juxtaposing priesthoods. It's about juxtaposing priesthoods. The book of Hebrews is always juxtaposing the Levitical priesthood as opposed to the Malkizedic order of the priesthood. So when Hebrews 7.3 says that the Malkizedic is without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days or end of life, it's talking about the Malkizedics are not listed in the Levitical genealogies. No record of any of their parents being from Levi is recorded, since neither was a priest in the order of Levi. Neither Shem nor Yeshua has beginning of days nor end of a priestly Levitical life, since neither was ordained to begin or end with in that Levitical service. It's the juxtaposition of Levi against Malkizedek. Yet both do have genealogies li listed in Scripture. Shem, like Yeshua, served in the eternal order, and positionally he prefigured Yeshua, who serves in that same eternal order that can never, never pass away. The book of Hebrews does not say Shem is immortal. Let's be clear on that. Rather, that he lives continually, as do all the righteous, including you and I, in redemption. Hebrews chapter 11 goes into much more detail on this. Shem was the ninth in the line of succession of this eternal Malkizedek order, so that it's said that he lives forever in spirit, as this reward is for being a partaker of its covenants of promise, Ephesians 2, of which we'll learn a lot more next week. You see, if you decide to enter into this priesthood, then you too, listen, if you decide to take this message and enter into this priesthood, then you too will live continually with all the Zadiks in the generations before you. But what is the calling of your generation? It's to return to royal covenant Torah. Not the broad road to the left of Torah, 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 rabbinicalism, and not the broad road to the right of lawlessness. But it's that narrow road do you remember when Balaam was on his donkey? There was one vineyard to the left. He was pressing against it, pressing against the wall. And there was another vineyard to the right. But when he stayed on that narrow road between the two vineyards, he encountered the Malak of Yahweh. And that's our calling. Don't be a dumbass, <laughs> but encounter the Malak of Yahweh. I'm going to get fired. <laughs> salvation. Salvation only comes by covenant. And covenant here in the Malkid Zedek is ratified by blood. It's the Malkid Zedek blood. Listen, it's the Malkid Zedek blood that enables you to enter into the covenant. 
You can't trample Hebrews 10, 26. I got the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. I pray the blood of Jesus. And you're trampling in the blood of Jesus. You're having a party and you're throwing the blood of Jesus all over you. The purpose of the blood is to lift it up and enter into covenant. If you're out here trampling the blood and you haven't entered into covenant, you are not saved. I said it. I mean it. It's true. The blood of Yeshua is to bring you into covenant. He ratified a new covenant. It is his blood that ratified a covenant. He didn't just get murdered and bleed. If he just bled outside of covenant, then he was just another righteous man that got killed. That's desecrating the blood. His blood had to be put on an altar and it had to ratify a covenant for him to be the Messiah. So don't trample on his blood and play in his blood outside of the covenant and say you're saved. Because salvation only comes through covenant, ratification by his blood. Jeremiah 31 verse 31 tells you that Yeshua would bring in a new covenant. The writer of the book of Hebrews tells you that Yeshua's blood brought in a new covenant. You can't dance around outside the blood and be lawless and say you're saved. It's insane. It's insane pagan religious nonsense. You're going to have to edit that because that is not going to be very popular, but it's the truth. I just can't fake it. I'm sorry. (laughs) It's insanity. What is going on in the world? It truly is. Drunk on the blood of Jesus, yet you won't do what he says. If you love me, keep my commandments. And walk in covenant. Outside of covenant is death. Inside of covenant is life. The only way you get an invitation into the covenant is by his blood. Use it with honor. Don't dance on it in desecration. You will be judged. Hebrews 10, 26. You who neglect the teachings of Moses... You trample the blood of Yeshua underfoot like it's a common thing. That is the 21st century. And it should scare the bejesus out of you. Let's get back to our narrative back in Genesis. What was going on between the meeting of Shem, Mount Kizadik, and Avraham? What was going on back there? Something very important was going back, was going on back in our text in Genesis. You see, Avraham meets Malkitzedek. Malkitzedek is Shem, we've discovered now. He was the ninth in the order. Noah, second Peter, was the eighth in that order. Adam was the first in that order. And Moses was the last in that order until the final Melchizedek would come. Death reigned from Adam to Moses. We're starting to put the pieces together of what this Melchizedek is. And it's the calling of the saints to enter into this priesthood, enter into the covenant that's ratified by the blood. You see, this is all coming together because there is a fake veneer of religion out there, a fake Messiah. There's an antichrist who's portraying... An antichrist doesn't mean it's a red-horned demon. It means it's somebody who's masquerading as the Messiah, looks like the Messiah, is faking you out, you, you, you think that you, you're in, but you're out. I mean, it, you see, S.A. Tan is the, he's going to masquerade as light. He's going to look just like the Messiah. He's going to have you so convinced that you are in and that you are safe, but he's going to have you out. Oh, he's going to give you some blood. Oh, yes, he's going to give you some blood. He's going to give you some culture and some holidays to mess around with that blood in. He may even throw in some eggs so you can have some fun with that. But he is not going to bring you into the covenant. He's going to fake you out. And that's going to lead the masses, the masses astray. Because they don't care. 
I, I, gone, I went off again, didn't I? <laughs> Can you stand up right here? Just down here. Every time I go off, just... <laughs> oh, I, uh. What was going on between Malki, Zadok, and Abraham? That was my question. Abraham had just defeated four kings at the battle. He had just defeated Amraphel, Arioch, Shedaloamar, remember that name, and Tidal. He just defeated these four kings. They had made war against Sodom. They had taken his nephew Lot captive. Now, King Shedolomar is mentioned in the meeting of Zedek and Avraham, if you look at Genesis chapter 14, verse 17. Then after this, after Avraham's return from the defeat of Shedolomar and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shever, King's Valley. It's just down the road. Genesis 14, 18. And Zedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of El Elyon, most high. He blessed him and he said, Blessed be Abram, Abram of Elohim, most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed, blessed be Elohim, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him the Ma'aser. He gave him the tithe, the tenth of all. Now why aren't the other kings mentioned by name? Why only is Shedolomar mentioned by name in chapter 14, verse 17? Why aren't the other kings mentioned by name, but Shedolomar, who Abraham just slaughtered, mentioned by name? It's because Shedolomar is a descendant of Shem. Shedolomar is a descendant of the Malkitzedek. Whoops. Abraham just slaughtered one of the Malkitzedek's family. Abraham just slaughtered one of the Malkitzedek's family. Shedalomar was king of Elam, Genesis 14.1. And Elam was a son of Shem, Genesis 10.22. Abraham, again, was one of Shem's descendants as well through Afraxad. So Shem, the Zedek, he's got Avraham, one of his descendants, and he's got Shedolomar, one of his descendants. Shem, the Zedek, shows up because it's a family feud. And he, as the governor, as the Zedek, is going to come and negotiate a peace treaty. And Avraham is going to then pay him a tenth of oil, and they're going to break bread and they're going to drink some Kiddush so that there isn't a mass slaughter. Because Avraham has got caught up in a family feud with the Zadik high clan leader. This is amazing stuff. Shem shows up and makes peace with Avram by bringing the bread and wine. Avram then makes peace with Shem, the Malkit Zedek, by giving him a tenth of all. It's a family feud. Avram, a descendant of the Malkit Zedek Shem, killed Shedolomar, a descendant of the Malkit Zedek Shem. You see, this actually then is going to go forward in prophecy because this is the base which everything jumps off with our interpretation and sets the stage for interpreting Zadik. This is going to show us and reveal the truth about Yeshua, the final Zadik. What's his job? What is his job? He is the one who is going to come and bring peace to a family feud after a great war between kingdoms and nations. That's the job of Yeshua. This sets the stage and it will build with our understanding on what the Zedek, the final Zedek Yeshua is going to be the one that comes and brings peace. He's going to reveal his peace. He is the king of Shalem. He is the prince of peace and he will bring an end to the great war between the kingdoms and the nations. And this is exactly what Psalm chapter 2, verse 1 informs us. Turn with me to Psalm chapter 2, verse 1. This, in fact, is quoted in Hebrews chapter 1 and 5. Fancy that. And it explains what is happening with the kings of the earth in Genesis 14. 
They took counsel against Yahweh. And they took counsel against his Melchizedek. Why do the nations rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The Melachim, the kings of the earth, they set themselves. And the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh. And against his anointed one saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Bands, bands, break the traditions of the fathers from us. They want to break the traditions of the Malkitzedic fathers. You see, that's what was happening with the War of the Kings in Genesis 14. They wanted to break the bands, the traditions of the Malkitzadic fathers before them. They wanted to break the traditions of Adam. They wanted to break the Malkitzadic traditions of Enosh. They wanted to break the Malkitzadic traditions of Seth, etc., etc. The Hebrew word here for traditions is Malser, and it comes from the root word Yassar, and it means the customs of of the Malkitzadik in context. They were warring against the priesthood. Is that happening today? They want to follow the rabbinic traditions. They want to break the Massah, the customs and the traditions of the Malkitzadik because they'd rather follow Levitical customs or they'd just rather be lawless. There's nothing new under the sun. That's another favorite verse of mine, it seems, right now. Masar, it means that which has been intertwined and passed down in a line, a sequence of ordering through the generations. Let's continue on to read Psalm 2. It says, The Shamaim, the heavens shall laugh. Yahweh shall have them in derision. How did he have them in derision? There were four kings against five. That would cause quite derision, wouldn't it? Then verse 5, Then shall he speak to them in his anger and trouble them in his heavy displeasure. Yet I have set my Melech, my king, upon my holy mountain of Zion. I will declare the decree. Yahweh has said to me, you are my son. This day I have brought you forth. Ask of me, and I shall give you the nations for your inheritance and the farthest parts of the earth for your possession. You see, because Abraham made shalom with the Malkit Zedek, in the very next verses, you see Abraham given the promise of kingship, land, and the Malkit Zedek line. You see that given. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. You see, the war between the seed of Abraham, the sons of Yitzhak, and the sons of Ishmael is because Yitzhak received what? He received the Malkitzedek and Ishmael didn't. He received the Malkitzedek and Ishmael didn't. Shem died, then Eber would have been the next in line. After Eber would have been Yitzhak, and after Yitzhak would have been Yaakov, and so on. Jacob. So we find that this line likely went through from Jacob through Levi because, like I said, death reigned from Adam to Moses. Yet later on, we find that King Solomon, describing himself as the preacher, he was the preacher of what? He was the preacher of righteousness. He was the preacher of the Malkit Zedek, Why? Because in Solomon's generation, he wanted to return to the Malkit Zedek. He was tired of the corruption that was happening in the priesthood all around him. And that was his cry. He was preaching the Malkit Zedek in his generation. Though not a Malkit Zedek, he had a desire and a return to it. Because his father had already seen the need for the Zadokites, had they not? And his son Solomon also saw the need for the elevation of the Zadoks, the sons of Zadok. You see, the writer of the book of Hebrews tells us that we can now enter into the Malkit Zadok realm through Yeshua by offering up both prayers and supplications with loud crying. 
and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. Although he was a son, he learned obedience. You see, by prayer, we can enter into a life of supplication. And oftentimes we will cry and there will be tears. But that should bring us into pious obedience. That's the Malkitetic calling. I want to talk about the way of the Essenes because many people would attribute this in history to the Zadokites. But I believe that the Zadokites and the Essenes are distinctly different. And as we discover through the Qumran, I do not believe it was the Essenes down there, but I believe it was the Zadokites that fled from the temple and went down there. I want to talk about the Zadokites that were in Qumran, and then I want to finish up with some text in the Brit Hadashar. Is that okay? Can you get me some more water? I'm really going through it today. I'm burning hot. Now, when we discovered the text in Qumran, it really changed the narrative in Bible interpretation. Many people have tried to bury and hide the revelations that have been coming out of Qumran. But we need to find out what those texts say. Excuse me. I really am burning hot. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 1947 by a Bedouin herdsman in a cave. Many of us know this. But in manuscript 11Q13, this text is about the coming of the Malkit Zedek. To the Qumran sect, to these Zadokites, the Malkit Zedek was the ever-present hope, and it was their imminent reality. Is the Malkit Zedek our imminent, rea imminent reality? That's the question that we have to ask. You see, the Zadokites, they believed that Malkit Zedek and Mashiach were interconnected. Their expectation was that for Malkit Zedek to appear, he was to be to them an exalted, even a divine being. So much so that modern manuscripts where you find the word Yahweh you would find in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Malkit Zedek. You see, they understood that the Malkit Zedek was Yahweh. They understood from Psalm 110 that Yahweh sat at Yahweh's right hand. Now, the Masorite scribes, they try to hide that, but we can now discover that, in fact, Yahweh does sit at the right hand of Yahweh. Give me a case in point right here. In the Dead Sea Scrolls in Isaiah 61, it is written thus to proclaim the acceptable year of Malkit Zedek and the day of vengeance of our Elohim to comfort all that mourn. You see, in the time of Yeshua, Isaiah's text in the Hebrew that we don't have anymore, but the Dead Sea Scrolls testifies that the text in Isaiah chapter 61 said that it was to proclaim the acceptable year of Malkit Zedek. That was actually put in place of the divine name, yod Hey vav Hey. Isn't that amazing? It becomes more amazing when we understand that Yeshua actually quoted this very verse before a bunch of rabbis in the synagogue. You see, the reign from King David, the Zadokites, they suddenly appear as priests. They were from the Malkit Zadok line, but with no covenant to attach their righteous priesthood to. You see, Zadik and Zadok are linguistically connected with the same three-letter root. We have the Zadi, the Dalit, and the Kuf. You see, the Zadokites, they were actually in the temple. They were the ones that were leading the priesthood until Antiochus came in and the time of the Maccabees, and then there was the Hasmonean dynasty. At that point, the Zadokites were thrown out of the temple. They took nothing with them. They were the poor. They went by the way down to Damascus, which was known as the area of Qumran. And the only thing that the Zadokites were able to take with them were the temple scrolls. That's why there were so many scrolls found at Qumran. They were the zealots, the Zadokites, that were down in Qumran. They were awaiting the Malkit Zedek to redeem them, and they understood that the Malkit Zedek was Yahweh, who sat 
at Yahweh's right hand. Their text bears this up. And we know that later on in the course of history of the Bible, that Josiah, in fact, removed all traces of anything non-Levitical. Anything non-Levitical, he removed it. So many of the Malkitzadic traditions in the temple were removed once the Zadokites were kicked out and once Josiah did his reforms. The Zadokite sect in Qumran at the time of Yeshua believed that the Malkitzadic, the anointed one, connecting to Messiah was expected to come and listen to this, to deliver a divine communication and then he would have to die, be cut off, as it is written in Daniel chapter 9, verse 26. That's what the Zadokites in Qumran fully expected. Now, many of you have heard of the Copper Scroll. Now, this was found in 1952 in Cave 3 in Qumran. And now, a man by the name of John Allegro, he oversaw the cutting of the copper sheets into 23 strips from 1955 to 1956. Now, Allegro transcribed their contents immediately, and he discovered, he discovered that the Zadokites were in fact the very matrix of Christianity. The very matrix of Christianity. He suggested that there were so many correspondences between the scroll texts and the New Testament words, various phrases, beliefs, and practices, even a messianic leadership, a teacher of righteousness, a Malkit Zadok, who would be persecuted, possibly crucified, and then resurrected. He discovered this in the Copper Scrolls. Yet the Israelis, they got to squash it. Because this kind of news... This is a game changer. This is a game changer with your interpretation of Qumran. So they keep pushing the Essenes. This is the Essenes. No, these were the Zadokites that were thrown out of the temple at the time of the Hasmonean dynasty. And their texts bear up that they believe that Yahweh sat on the right hand of Yahweh, that he was the Malkit Zadok, the righteous preacher, in a line of succession that would have to come die, possibly through crucifixion, and then deliver a message of righteousness and bring in a priesthood. That was why they were always having ritual immersion in preparation for the war that was about to happen. And they would, from time to time, as zealots, they would go up to Jerusalem on raids of zealotry amongst the Romans. And many of them, in fact, were in the flock of Yeshua because Yeshua and John the Baptist Yeshua's missing years, where was he? He was down in Qumran being taught by his elder, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, why was he a Baptist? He was a mikvah oat. He was one who was in charge of the mikvah pools down at Qumran, and he just continued to do his job, but out there at the Jordan. Because the time was ripe, the Malkit Sedek was going to ascend. Now, this is amazing, because we're going to see this now play out in the Scripture. Because you have to be a priest before you can offer a sacrifice, don't you? Otherwise, you're going to be drunk on blood, and it means nothing. You have to be a priest before you can offer a sacrifice. What a concept. What a concept. The high priest stands. He would stand to officiate over the sacrifice. Only once the sacrifice is fully consumed can that priest sit down. He has to wait until the sacrifice is what? Finished. It is finished is the key word. You see, prophets have a divine message. Priests have to have an altar and a sacrifice. And kingdoms, well, they have to have a king. Let's see how Yeshua fulfilled all of these roles in perfect sequencing, because we are talking about a sequence of things. Let's see how Yeshua fulfilled all these roles, prophet, priest, and king, in perfect sequencing to be able to provide our redemption. 
and to see if you believe that the priesthood is open and available to the circumcised of heart today. And this is how I'll finish. In Matthew chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 2, what does the writer establish about Yeshua? He's a king. He's a melech. He's the king. He's the Malki. Matthew 1 and 2 establish that Yeshua is the king through the genealogy that he has the right to the kingship. The mantle of priesthood, however, is always handed down through ritual immersion, mikvah, or in the Greek, baptisma, where we get baptism. The Jordan River is a geographic point of change. And remember, principalities, our war is not against flesh and blood, principalities study your genealogy and they operate geographically. How many of you have ever gone to a, a city or a location and you're like, man, it feels evil here. My wife and I, before kids, we went to Chichen Itza down in Mexico. I mean, it was like full of demons. I mean, it was a horrible place. We didn't know, you know. Let's go look at the Mayan ruins. I couldn't sleep. I thought I was going to be beheaded and put on a spike in the middle of the night. I mean, we couldn't get out of there fast enough. We got up earlier. Oh, let's get out of here. Who knows what's coming out of the jungle? I mean, we could feel the demons. They, offer through you. they operate through your genealogy and they operate geographically. If you live in Kaiser, move. <laughs> Matthew chapter 2, Yeshua, he was born king of the Jews, saying, where is he that was born king of the Jews? For we have seen his kokav, his star in the east, and have come to worship him. Yeshua now, we have established he is king. But he must fulfill all righteousness through a legal high priest. And who is the legal high priest? Is it Caiaphas? No, the system is totally corrupt at the time of Yeshua. John the Baptist, however, as we can see, he was in the line of Avijah. He was the legal high priest. But he wasn't going up and operating in the temple. Why? Because it was sick, perverted, and twisted like religion today. And he would have no part of it. He would have been kicked out of every church. And he was in the desert. And he was preaching righteousness. He was the legal high priest. Now, the mantle of priesthood has to operate and transfer through mikvah. Yeshua is the king. He's the Malki. And then John comes to him and he says this very important saying. Very important saying. Yeshua says it to John. Excuse me. I got that back to front. Matthew chapter 3 verse 13. Then Yeshua came from Galilee to the Jordan River to Yochanan, John to be immersed, mikvahed by him. But Yochanan, John, he forbade him, saying, I have need to be mikvahed to be immersed by you, and you have come to me. And Yeshua answered him, said to him, allow it to be so, for this will allow us to fulfill all Zadakah. You have to allow this to be so because I am a Malki already established as the king. But you as the high priest are now going to immerse me in the water. I'm going to go into the water as a Malki and then when I come up it will establish all Zadakah. I will be the Malki Zadik because you will transfer the priesthood authority to me. This happens right here. Right here, we now see the ordination of Yeshua into the Melchizedek priesthood. This is key. This is key to your salvation and my salvation because this is all going to frame the covenant. And it began, like we saw, by the order of things spoken back in Genesis chapter 14. Yeshua comes to John as the king. And he says, you have to make for me so that we can fulfill all righteousness. I will go into the water, Malki. I will come up, Malki, Zadik, thus fulfilling all righteousness. And he allowed him to do it. So Yeshua is a master king, but raised out of the water as the Malki Zadik. A king who fulfills all righteousness is nothing else but the Malki Zadik through the key word transference. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 11. 
If therefore perfection, the Greek word there, teleos, the goal, if the goal could be reached by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the book of the law, what further need was there that another Cohen priest should arise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, the Greek word here, transferred, there is made a necessity, a necessity, a transference also in the book of the law. Something amazing happens. You see, and we'll get into this next week. It's a real simple paradigm when we understand it. The book of the law and the book of the covenant are two distinct books. The book of the covenant is royal covenant of which Abraham lived by. Abraham never knew a Levite. He never knew what the Levitical temple service looked like. Neither did Jacob. Isaac, they didn't know that. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they had no concept about anything Levitical. They'd never met a Levite. In fact, Levi paid tithes to Abraham through the loins. Excuse me, Levi paid tithes to Melchizedek through the loins of Abraham, the writer of Hebrews tells us. The important thing we're going to learn is that the book of the covenant is royal Torah. And it was a covenant. And when that covenant was broken, it was offered to them at Exodus 19. They broke it at Exodus 32 with the sin of the golden calf. That Yahweh was going to slaughter all of Israel. But the last Melchizedek high priest who did not get in the transgression of the golden calf, Moses, he pleaded and interceded with Yahweh. And Yahweh said, I will impose on them. They haven't agreed to this. But this is the only way that I will not slaughter all of Israel, is I will impose on them the book of the law. And this will keep them under mediation. It will be a tutor for them. And it will keep them safe and protect them until the time of reformation when the seed will come. There will be a transference of the priesthood. He will then die, pay the death penalty position, and he will bring in a new covenant of royal Torah, and you will be back, and you will walk as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob did, because you are the seed of Abraham. You see, we are not under law doesn't mean that we can be lawless. It means that you're not under the book of the law, the tutor, the schoolmaster that mediated them. You are now, if you know the Melchizedek, you are able to enter into a new covenant and return to the book of the covenant, royal Torah, which is Yahweh's wonderful Shabbats, feasts, Moedim, and everything that is righteous and holy to put in your mouth and to come out of your mouth, and you will live as a royal priesthood. But we can see now here that perfection never came through the Levitical priesthood. It could never be attained. It was a temporary schoolmaster to train them up, and they had to pay a debt each and every day of blood. Blood had to be shed, blood had to be shed, blood had to be shed. And all that did was just keep Yahweh from calling in the note until somebody finally would come and have to pay the full debt. Once the full debt was paid, then that transferred and you now are able to go back into royal Torah, Genesis 1-1, all the way through to Exodus 24-10. Royal covenant Torah. It's an amazing thing. We'll learn more about that next week. Let me continue on with this transference of Yeshua into this priesthood of Melchizedek, which enables us now to enter into covenant royal Torah. Matthew 3, verse 13, is where this transference of the Levitical to the Melchizedek order begins. Between the two kinsmen, John the Baptist and Yeshua, the mantle of priesthood is handed down through Mikvah. The Jordan River is the point of change. But if Yeshua is now the legitimate high priest, what about the Levitical high priest that's operating up in Jerusalem? What are we going to do with Caiaphas? You see, let's visit the background to the qualifications of the high priest. Let's look at this thing called the trespass offering, and let's see how it will affect Yeshua's qualifications. Turn with me to Leviticus chapter 5 and verse 1.
And if a being sins and hears the voice of swearing, and he is a witness, whether he has seen or known it, if he does not reveal it, then he shall bear his iniquity. This means if somebody hears an oath, if somebody swears this oath right here in Leviticus chapter 5, if somebody swears this oath and you hear them, if you're a witness of it and you know truth but you do not reveal the truth, then you are sin, in sin, and you will be guilty and bear the judgment. Does that make sense? Now, turn with me to Leviticus chapter 10, verse 6. And Moshe said to Aaron and to Eliezer and to Ithamar his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither tear your clothes, lest you die. You rip your priestly garments, you annul your position. You're disqualified and you'll die. You've got to be careful if you're a priest. You've got to be careful if you're a Levitical high priest. You better be careful when you get dressed. In fact, Yahweh's so merciful, he doesn't want you to have a wardrobe malfunction that he puts a clause in in Exodus 28 verse 32 for those wardrobe malfunctions. I wish he would do that for... Um, who is that singer? He, I wish he would have that clause for Beyonce. When she has a, more, a, a wardrobe malfunction, she should just like be incinerated, like the guy that reached out and touched the ark. That's the clause that should go in for the Super Bowl performances. If you want to be a rock star and you want to come to Super Bowl, then we have a wardrobe malfunction clause. It's from the word of Yahweh, and it goes something like this. If you show your boobs, you will be incinerated. Why not? He's going to be up all night editing this. <laughs> Can you say, Kamucha? <laughs> now, apparently, you don't want to take that stuff out of the fridge and set it in the sun. Because it, uh, apparently, it can get quite saucy. Oh. She's looking right at me. Former Marine. Not an ex-Marine, because that means you're dead, right? So, you're supposed to salute me back. Okay. Oh, yeah, you'd have to stand up. Yeah, he's, he's by the book. I love that man. Let's continue on. Let's continue on. And Moshe said to Aaron and to Eliezer and to Ithamar, his sons, Uncover not your heads, neither tear your clothes, lest you die. But Yahweh has a provision. That's where I left off. Exodus 28, verse 32, for those wardrobe malfunctions. And there shall be a hole in the top of it. This is a hole in the top of the priestly garment. In the midst of it, it shall have a binding of woven work all around the whole of it, and, as it were, the whole of strong armor that it be not be torn. So what Yahweh would do is he would put this strong armor around the woven part of the priestly garment so that it wouldn't accidentally be torn. Because if it was torn, then their priesthood would be annulled, they would lose their position, and they would die. So Yahweh is merciful here, is he not? He's truly merciful. Now, Matthew chapter 26, verse 57. Because we have a problem. Yeshua is a Malki, and John, who is the legitimate high priest, immerses him, thus fulfilling all righteousness, and he comes up a Malki Zedek. But there's this other guy, Caiaphas, up on the hill, who's pretending to be a high priest. If Yeshua is the legitimate high priest, we've got to deal with this guy. And Yeshua's going to deal with him. But he's going to deal with him based upon Scripture. 
Matthew chapter 26, verse 57. And they that had laid hold of, on Yeshua led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the shofrim, the scribes, and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed him from afar off to the high priest's palace and went in and sat with the slaves and the servants to see the result. Now the main priest and the elders and all the Sanhedrin sought false witnesses against Yeshua to put him to death. Verse 60, but they found none. Yes, though many false witnesses came, yet they found none. At the end came two false witnesses, and they said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the Bet HaMikdash, the temple of Yahweh, and to build it in three days. Verse 62. And the Kohen Haggadol, the high priest, stood, and he said to him, Don't you respond? What is all this that these witnesses against you? But Yeshua kept his silence. Yeshua kept his silence. And the high priest answered and said to him, this is key, I put you under oath. What oath? The high priest is now putting Yeshua under the oath of the trespass offering in chapter 5, verse 1. He's going to now speak. If Yeshua knows the truth, and he remains silent, then Yeshua is a sinner and he cannot be your Messiah. He is now going to put him under the oath of the trespass offering. I put you under oath before the living Eloa that you tell us whether you are the Messiah, the Son of the Almighty. Does Yeshua know that he's the Messiah? Does he know that he's the son of the Almighty? And if he doesn't speak this truth, then he's a sinner and he cannot be your Messiah. Caiaphas invoked the first law of the trespass offering, Leviticus chapter 5, verse 1. Yeshua simply had to answer him, or he would have been in sin, he would have been a sinner, he would have been defiled, he would have been disqualified to represent you and me. Yeshua said to him, you have said it. Is that good enough? Caiaphas, you have said it. No, that's not good enough. Yeshua has to say it. He can't just let Caiaphas say it. He has to make the distinction. And he says it. Yeshua said to him, you have said it. Nevertheless, because I'm not going to break the law of the trespass offering, I... I'm going to say it. After this, you shall see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of Yahweh and coming in the clouds of the heavens. Then the high priest tore his clothes. He tore his clothes saying, He has spoken blasphemy. He just disqualified his priesthood and he has to die. He just disqualified his priesthood in front of all the elders, in front of the Sanhedrin. They must have been, oh, buddy, drop it. <laughs> Who's going to officiate our, over the Passover sacrifice that year? Can you tell me? Caiaphas isn't. The only legitimate high priest in the whole of the nation that year is Yeshua the Messiah who is going to officiate over his own sacrifice, not after the order of Levi that is abolished and passed away, but over the order of Melchizedek. Caiaphas, you're done, you're dead. In front of witnesses, in front of witnesses, there's no getting around it. No getting around it at all. What further need do you have of witnesses? See, now you have heard his blasphemy. Verse 66. What do you think? They answered and said, he is guilty of death. What? Hypocrites. No, dude, you're the one that's guilty of death. See how religiously entrenched they were? 
They were so blinded by their religion and their doctrine that they couldn't even see that Caiaphas was the one that was guilty of death. They were so entrenched in their religious doctrines. And, do and you don't think that your pastors and your rabbis are so entrenched in their religious doctrines today? They're so entrenched. They can't see the Malkit Zedek. They can't see the commandments of Yahweh. But they'll have you doing the traditions and customs of the nations. But they're so entrenched, they can't see righteousness. But because thousands and thousands of people do the vain customs of men, but only a few follow the commandments of Yahweh, you're going to go after the sheeple instead of after the righteous? That's the broad road. Follow the Savior and find His people. Follow the Savior and find His people. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 20 Inasmuch as he, Yeshua, the Malkitzedek, was not made priest without an oath. How was he made the high priest? Because Caiaphas put him under the oath, and Yeshua spoke the oath, and then Caiaphas nullified his priesthood because he was an idiot. <laughs> For they become priests without an oath, but he with the oath by him. The oath of the trespass offering is how Yeshua became the high priest. And next week we'll discover the matrix of this Malkitzedek with the oath of Genesis 12. The ultimate test of qualification for the priesthood. Hebrews 7 verse 28. For the Torah makes men koanim, gedolim in the Hebrew, who have human weaknesses, but the word of the oath, which was after the Torah appointed the Son who has been perfected forever and ever. That oath perfected him. It made him the high priest of the order of Malkitzedek, both in the natural, Caiaphas, and from the heavenlies through John the Baptist. John 19, verse 23, finishing up now. Then the soldiers, when they had impaled Yeshua, they took his garments. Remember what we just said. What did we just read in Leviticus chapter 10? That if you rip the high priest's garments, then his priesthood is annulled, he's disqualified, and he's dead. So now we found that Yeshua has the transference of the priesthood from the Levitical priesthood. It has now transferred to Yeshua, the Malkitzedek, not only through the legitimate high priest himself, John the Baptist, but even through the phony high priest, Caiaphas. We've got two witnesses. In fact, we've got a whole room of witnesses. We have two witnesses to Yeshua's high priesthood because to establish a truth, a matter, we need the testimony of two witnesses. Two witnesses, and now we know that Yeshua is now the high priest after the order of Malkitzedek, that the Levitical priesthood has now abolished. Oh, that's hard for some to hear, but it's true. And that now we had better be very careful with how we handle Yeshua's garments, correct? Amen. Look what the text says. Then the soldiers in John 19, 23, when they had impaled Yeshua, they took his garments and they made four parts to every soldier a part and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. This was a special coat. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it. Why would the, why would the writers of the New Testament make such point to include Yeshua's laundry list in the text. Why? Oh, just because they want you to know about his stitching and his garments? No, they want to establish that he is a legitimate priest, high priest after the order of Malkitzedek. Because now we're going to find something very interesting. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but let's cast lots for it to seize who it should be. 
that the katuv, the writings might be fulfilled, which said, they parted my clothes among them, and for my robe did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Let us not tear it, because it's the high priest's tunic, and it can't be torn, otherwise Yeshua's priesthood would be nulled, and he hasn't sat down yet. He's still standing. He's still standing. Remember, what did Caiaphas do? He stood up to make the judgment. Yeshua hasn't been able to sit down. He has not finished his role yet, so you cannot rip his garments. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 9. Then he said, Behold, I come to do your will, O Yahweh. He takes away the first sacrificial system that he may establish the second. But that desire we are now kadosh, holy, through the offering of the body of Yeshua HaMashiach once and for all. And that every priest stands daily serving and offering the same sacrifices, which can never, never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for the sins forever and ever, sat down at the right hand of Yahweh, Psalm 110, verse 5, waiting then from then on until all of his enemies are made his footstool. This is quoting the one and only Malkitzedic text in the entire Old Testament apart from Genesis 14. The high priest can only sit down once the sacrifice is fully consumed. As high priest, he has to stand until the sacrifice is completed. Yeshua cannot sit down until it is finished. Luke 7 verse 28. For I say to you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater navi. There is not a greater prophet than Yochanan HaMatbil. John the Baptist is greater than Daniel. He's greater than Moses. Oh, you just stood on a bunch of toes right there. He's greater than Jeremiah. Of all the prophets, there is none greater than John the Baptist. But he that is least in the kingdom of Yahweh is greater than him. He who is least in the kingdom of Malkitzedek is greater than he who is greatest of Levitical. He who is least in the kingdom of Malkitzedek is greater than he who is greatest of the Levitical. It's all about the transference of the priesthood and walking in its prophetic and apostolic authority. The least of Malkitzedek, you and I, are greater than a prophet from Levi. Why aren't we moving in this Yahweh given, divinely given Malkitzedek authority amongst the nations, amongst our assemblies? Why aren't we moving in this authority? Ministry comes from resurrection, and resurrection comes from Elohim, and resurrection is the permanent rule of service, and it doesn't pass away. And we have been resurrected, born again, into the Malkitzedek priesthood, that you are a kingdom of priests after the order of Malkitzedek. This is an amazing journey. Peel off the veneer and preach the truth, but don't fall into the ditch of lawlessness on your right-hand side. And don't fall into the ditch of rabbinical Torah on your left-hand side with all of the Levitical hierarchy that has passed away. Go back to what Abraham knew. Was Abraham perfect in Yahweh's law? Abraham was perfect in Yahweh's law. 
Yet he knew nothing of the Levitical temple sacrifices. Well, how could he be perfect? Because he was perfect in the royal covenant Torah. James the Zadik says to return to the royal law. That's Melchizedek. And it's an amazing journey. My journey's been 20 odd years. Ten of that steeped in rabbinical Torah. But I had to go through that after I was in the greasy grace for 10 years. I went from greasy grace into rabbinical Torah. And now Yahweh is showing me the narrow road that leads to life. And I pray that through my mistakes that many would not have to go into lawlessness, but they wouldn't have to go and try and navigate the doctrines and denominations of Messianic Torah, that they can literally get on the right track of royal Torah, the covenants, the feasts, festivals, Sabbaths, and dietary commandments of Yahweh to bring you into healthy kingdom living. It's an amazing journey. It's an amazing life. But only few shall seek it. Not many shall find it. But we have, and praise Yahweh for that. Amen. 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 Woo! Questions, comments, cabbage! We have three. You doing the middle finger at me? No, no. Oh, three, three fingers. fingers. Okay, brother. Marine in the back. I mean, you never know. He was just like, oh, could it be my salute? Oh, man. <laughs> no, the. We had three, three questions. I guess that's on. I can't tell. Okay. Uh, what constitutes salvation? Just asking Messiah in your heart, or does he one need to be immersed in Mayim to be saved? Uh, right. Do you need to be Mikford to be saved? No, you don't need to be Mikford to be saved. Um, I should do a teaching on salvation. I did one a, a, a while back from the Hebrew perspective. It's Brit Milah Halev, circumcision of the heart. That's what Jeremiah 31, 31 talks about. Salvation comes through the Messiah's shed blood and the circumcision of your heart so that your heart bleeds. And with that blood coming into union with Messiah, then you're to walk and to do works worthy of repentance. That's covenant lifestyle. That's royal Torah. So I believe he has mercy, the withholding of just judgment. I was saved when I was 24, and I began to do works of righteousness, but it took me a decade to figure out that I should stop being lawless. But lawlessness was a great, you know, a great improvement from walking hand in hand with the devil. So, you know, <laughs> Yahweh was faithful to me. Okay, next question. If we are truly Melchizedek priests... Are we also authorized to immerse for salvation into Messiah, or do we need to be some certified minister like all others? No, you have the authority under the Malchizedek priesthood if you are circumcised of heart to mick for and immerse others and lead many into the priesthood and the salvation that comes through Yeshua. But it's always got best to go by twos, so you can hold yourself accountable and be held accountable. And the, the final question from yeah. uh, the audience is, what number is Yeshua as the final Melchizedek? What number? That's what they say. What okay, number? well, death reigned from Adam to Moshe, so Moshe would have to figure out what number Moshe was as far as the Melchizedek, and then Yeshua would be the one after Moshe, the final Melchizedek. Okay. We could do that. We could look up that genealogy timeline and figure it out. So it went down. We figured we established so far that Shem was the ninth, is that correct? Yeah, Shem. Um, no, no, Noah was the eighth. Noah was the eighth. Shem was the ninth. Thank you. Noah was the eighth. Shem was the ninth. So then we could follow from there through the genealogy and um, see where Moses ended up. He would be then that number. Then Yeshua would be the next, the final. We had John also, right? Yochanan Hamatbeel, John the Immerser. He was, he was a high priest under the order of Levi. Oh, that's right, under you Levi. You see, death reigned from Adam to Moshe. Moshe was, in fact, the last Malkizedek high priest who was under Malkizedek covenant. When the Malkizedek covenant, book of the covenant, was broken, then the priesthood was transferred from Malkizedek to Levi, and then the Levite priesthood ran all the way 
to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was the last, Mal um, the last Levitical high priest, and then it transferred back to the Malkitzedic, the final Malkitzedic. So there was this gap. Moshe, the last Malkitzedic in the wilderness. Then we have all Levitical, and John, the last Levitical, and then Yeshua, the final Malkitzedic. Yeah. Great stuff, isn't it? The mystery of the Malkitzedic. Wow. Next week, we will delve even deeper into the distinction between the book of the covenant and the book of the law. Amen.